Welcome to this episode of the Capital Playbook. We are so happy to have you. My name is Charles Williams. I am the owner and managing member of Pioneer Realty Capital. And uh, today we're absolutely pleased to have someone with us who's been on our show before, uh, but he's here to share some really good information. Mr. Vincat Avasarala. I knew I was going to mess up your name. Avasarala. Um, and he's with Stryker Properties. Welcome, Big Cat. Hey, thanks for having me, Charles. Well, thanks for being with us again. So today we're going to talk about a syndication. Uh, now, that's a big word, uh, but we're going to simplify that word, talk about what it means in the context of commercial real estate. Uh, Vincat has uh, raised a lot of money through syndication. Uh, he's uh, accomplished a, a lot of uh, uh, good things in terms of acquiring property, and uh, transitioning that property and creating value uh, with those assets. So we're going to dig into some of his secrets and then talk about some of the things that he's doing now. But in this process, you're going to learn uh, the language of this industry. Uh, you're going to learn how these deals are put together, some of the pitfalls, uh, and some of the things that could really help you as you develop your commercial real estate career. A couple of housekeeping things. If you are watching us on YouTube, uh, be sure and do us a favor and subscribe to our channel and then also like our channel uh, or like our episode. Uh, that, uh, that tells us that's the feedback we need to know that we are providing the type of content that's beneficial to you. And it allows us to attract guests like uh, Mr. Avasarala and other folks who are active in the industry, who are making things happen, who are getting deals done. Uh, so with that being said, uh, let's talk about syndication. Now, Vincat, um, before we uh, get deep into syndication, tell us a little bit about your background, uh, your career, and how you got into commercial real estate. Absolutely. It's quite a journey, actually. Um, I was an electrical engineer. I still am by education, but okay. I don't practice it. Uh, so I came to United States as an immigrant in 2002, went to University of Alabama Huntsville or Rocket City, where our Apollo program was built right. and designed by Warner Warren Braun. Um, so yeah, that's what attracted me to that city, I mean, the high tech nature of that. So got my master's degree in electrical engineering over there and ended up in IT. So worked 14 years in IT, worked with several Fortune 500 companies like Bank of America, PepsiCo, Halliburton, and so forth. And around 2007 is when I started, just before the recession, um, I started acquiring single family properties, mostly for passive income, right? So I keep doing that all the way into 2015. I have a portfolio of 20 homes. I own them all, I manage them all, and that is how it used to be, but uh, I couldn't scale it. I couldn't scale it. And then 2016 is when I started um, syndication along with commercial properties, um, just multifamily, basically multifamily BNC class uh, apartments. So syndication allowed me to buy these large properties that I couldn't buy all by myself, mm -hmm. right? So I was reduced to buying a single family here and there, but it, there's just insane competition. Mm -hmm. And what really turned me to c commercial real estate, especially apartments was, there was once a, uh, a flyer that I had received in email saying that there's a house in Garland here uh, for let's say $200,000 and it's worth 225 or something like that. The spread is not a whole lot, but it's in decent condition. So I went there, there's literally 50 people there. I'm not exaggerating, wow. there are 50 people in front of that house. Wow. And they said, what's going on? It's like, yeah, put your offer in a hat on a piece of paper. <laughs> That's what they said <laughs> and I did. And I put 230 when they wanted 225. And they said, okay, if you win, we'll call. And I was thinking, I am going to win because he wanted 225, gave it 230. Right. Um, then the call never comes. And then I call him, he's like, what's up? Oh yeah, I mean, we are way past that. It traded some 250, 260 that somewhere. That's insane. But, so, but you said the house is what, 225, right? And then I was like, yeah, he said, yeah, but people are just thinking on future, mm -hmm. right? I, I wasn't comfortable doing those kind of things. And, and in the retrospect, they did correct, right? I mean, right. the house is tremendously appreciated from 2015 to now, oh, of course, but yeah. I couldn't get there. I wasn't comfortable. Right. And again, this is one of the things, right? I mean, just because everybody's doing something, we don't have to do that either. We have to be comfortable. We, we, nothing should cost us a good night's sleep, right? Right. right. Uh, if, if it's costing your sleep, you just gambled. You didn't invest. Right. Right. So with that said, you know, I said, okay, you look, my days with a single family are numbered here. I need to scale. 
And that is when I went to multifamily, learned the basics of syndication, worked with a syndication lawyer here. Uh, it's not record science, but there is a method to madness here. Uh, whenever you try to raise money, the government gets involved, right? Yeah. For, for right reasons, of right? Course, I right. fully welcome that. Otherwise, uh, there will be bad actors left and right, and, and they still happen, right? right? And then they spoil this whole thing for everybody. So I welcome government intervention here where there is a, a specific SEC rules, mm -hmm. specific regulations that you have to follow. You have to hire a lawyer, and there is a process, and I followed it, and uh, I raised around $101 million. I had no idea that anybody would give me $101 million till date. Right. Um, so I started with my $1.2 million raise. That's my very first raise, mm -hmm. and it filled up in a couple of weeks, and never looked back. I mean, people gave me money, and I don't advertise, I don't do digital marketing and all that. So these are the people that I know, referrals, the, right. the community of investors that I have grown myself. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm sure our audience uh, will be uh, very interested to, to hear about uh, the specifics of that journey. But let's get into a little bit of details about uh, syndication. Now, what is syndication? So syndication in, in simplest form is a group of investors mm -hmm. coming together, pooling their money, and buying a larger asset, which individually they cannot buy by themselves. Okay. Now, there. Now we cannot have too many cooks in the kitchen, right? right. I mean, that that's the recipe for disaster. So that's why there is two classes mm -hmm. of um, shares. I mean, basically we pool all the money and we buy the acquire the property under the name of LLC. No one person or a group of people own it directly on the title. Mm -hmm. The title of the property is always taken on an LLC. Correct. And then there are two classes of people, the general general partners and mm -hmm. limited partners. Limited mm -hmm. partners are otherwise known as passive investors. The only thing they do is they write the check and they just sit mm -hmm. and watch the GPs work, right? So And the GPs get a, a promote, mm -hmm. right? So GPs do put their money, but they get a disproportionate re return on their money mm -hmm. compared to the limited partners, higher, disproportionately higher, because they found the deal they raised all the money, they're doing all the work. So as a compensation for that, they get a promote to that. So in a simplest form, that is it. Well, but there's a little bit more to that, right? Like I was alluding to earlier, uh, whenever you try to go raise money, mm -hmm. um, government want to protect the citizens, right? Just so that they know what they're getting into um, and there is no surprises there. And because if everything starts in a good foundation, it's a rinse and repeat kind of business, right? right. Once you keep your investors happy, they don't want to take the money. Well, they'll take the wire and wire it right back to you in the, in the next one. So they gave us a set of rules uh, which are um, described under um, Regulation 506B and 506C. Those are the two common regulations. Sure. Um, and what it allows us to do is to take mo uh, raise money from accredited investors mm -hmm. and sophisticated investors, mm -hmm. but in Regulation 506B, which is what I use, which allows me to take both accredited and sophisticated, mm -hmm. and but I cannot advertise. And right. I have I don't advertise anyway, mm -hmm. so that fits my needs. But 506C is something like where you can take a billboard if you want, you can advertise all you want, but only you can take accredited investors. Right, correct. So, uh, so let's just kind of recap some of this. Um, so let's say there, there's an asset we're gonna purchase. Um, the asset is $20 million. Mm -hmm. And um, you know you're going to take this property. Your goal as a, a GP, a general partner, so mm -hmm. you're you're the person uh, who's going to uh, basically run the business part of. It. That is correct. Okay, uh, um, and you'll put some of your money into it, um, but you're going to be compensated in the way of an acquisition fee mm -hmm. that you're going to charge uh, the LLC. That's correct. Um, then you're going to um, be compensated. Uh, disproportionately on your return on the investment that you've made. That is correct. Okay, after you hit a certain return threshold. That is correct. And so after you hit that return threshold, um, that additional income that you receive is generally referred to in the industry as a promote. That is correct. Okay, uh, so a lot of people, you know, we, we talk about it because we do this every day. Yes. Uh, but a lot of people, uh, they don't know what those terms mean. Absolutely. Uh, so, so I wanted to kind of break that down. So now the passive investor, um, in general, based on your experience and the investments you've made, uh, what are the general targeted returns and what, what have you been seeing uh, over the last, I guess, 10 years you've been doing this uh, in actual returns 
uh, your passive investors are getting. Absolutely. So return is completely tied to the quality of the product that you're buying. Mm -hmm. If you're buying a core product, which mm -hmm. is like, uh, let's say in the downtown right. area, where the risk of operating or losing money on that or an inability to collect rent on it is almost zero, right? Mm -hmm. That's a core product. Core plus is your 2005 and plus in a very affluent neighborhoods mm -hmm. and all that. They're not exactly in the downtown or, or, or an uptown, but they're in a nice locations. Mm -hmm. And then there is value add, right? And then there is uh, value add where uh, you go in there and buy these 60s, 70s, 80s properties, mm -hmm. uh, and then try to rehab them interior and exterior, raise the rents, reduce the expenses, and mm -hmm. flip it for profit and hold it for cash flow, either way or both. Mm -hmm. um, so these are opportunistic value add, mm -hmm. right? Um, so as you come down the ladder from core to core plus to value add, mm -hmm. obviously your return profile goes up. Right, but you are taking higher risk. Right, I so mean, the risk premium. There you go. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. So the kind of returns my investors look for, the, like uh, who buys these core products? Right, they pay like two percent a year or three percent a year mm -hmm. if that. But overall, on a ten-year horizon, you will hit a ten IRR, mm -hmm. which is not very bad actually. Right, mm -hmm. I mean a ten IRR is like a double your money in seven and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something that is very attractive for institutions like mm -hmm. pension funds, life insurance companies, uh, endowment funds, they they like this thing because they want to buy something like a coupon clipper, they get a small pay and they'll wait it out, they're mm -hmm. not in a hurry. But for syndic as a syndicator, I raise money from investors, very educated people. So my investors are mostly IT people, doctors, lawyers, uh, business owners. Mm -hmm. They are all busy with right. their work, their kids, home and everything, mm -hmm. and they're just so overwhelmed that they're just parking their money in a Chase or a Bank of America account and just leaving it there. Right. Because they're terrified of doing anything. Right. right? And some people have who have time, they play stock market or cryptos or whatever, but they know they're smart that they don't want to put all the eggs in one basket. Right. right? And also some business owners, they would like some extra depreciation and all that. So everybody have different, different reasons, mm -hmm. but what I see is my investors 10 IRR is not going to cut it, mm -hmm. right? Um, or and also they, I, I don't think they'll like a 10 year project either right, because right. they might need that money back in three to five years right. to send the kid to the college, right? Mm -hmm. So that the, I structure my deals according to my investors' duration expectations mm -hmm. and the return expectations, right. which is around three to five years, is is what mm -hmm. I uh, I raise money for my project durations. And uh, returns wise on a value add, I'm doing anywhere between 15 to 18 IRR, mm -hmm. right? Now, are, is that, now you said IRR, but are you really saying cash on cash return? No, 50, IRR is internal rate of return. Right. Uh, cash on cash return would be like on a cash flow, mm -hmm. I look for 8% or better. Okay. Um, it's incredibly hard to find, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you have to scour the earth and, and just look under every rock here to find those 8% cash flow deals, mm -hmm. which don't cash flow 8% rarely mm -hmm. in, 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 on day one anyway, right? right because right. you have to go and add the value and six to 12 months to 18 mm -hmm. months, you can get it up to 80%, per, 8%. Okay. But the equity multiple is a common term, like you invest yeah. $100,000, what do you get back, mm -hmm. right? So, so what kind of equity multiples are you getting? Two X. Two X equity multiple. Is, is the kind of deal wow. that I'm doing that's, on. That's pretty good. Right. So, so on a um, three year deal, if I invested uh, $100,000 with you, um, when you uh, go through the cycle of that asset, mm -hmm. acquisition, repositioning, disposition, yeah. when all of that's done, mm -hmm. um, then that 100000 is going to turn into 200000 200000 but there is a small caveat there, okay. right? So how fast do you want to get to? The equity multiple I target is 2x. That mm -hmm. is what I want to deliver to my investors. Mm -hmm. You can get there sooner if you're doing a ground-up construction project or okay. a land development project. Okay. Because sweat equity, right? Because you are, uh, that's one ultimate you, value. You create the most value. Correct. You're bringing it from the ground, right? right. You're creating mm -hmm. something out of nothing there. Mm -hmm. So you get paid more. Right, so that's why I can get there sooner, three, three and a half years. Mm -hmm. But if it's value add, well, you just bought something at a three and a half, four, four and a half cap, right? And you cannot possibly think that we can double money in eight, 
not that it won't happen in it, markets it, like it's been a crazy dollar. market lately oh and, yeah and so we've seen it happen yes but it's not typical we have to <laughs> treat them as exceptions to the rule exactly right, right, right. <laughs> they're not the rule right they're just exceptions to the rule sure but what i do look for is a five-year uh, double even in value add mm -hmm. right um and some investors are happy i mean they're, they're saying you know what i'll wait for the five years mm -hmm. but i need some cash flow coming in I am not in a hurry, I'll double my money in five years. Okay. But some, they said that, look, I need appreciation, quick mm -hmm. appreciation, right? So they invest with me in my land development projects mm -hmm. and ground up development projects. So a little bit for everybody, but the ultimate aim is to um, double investors' equity. And again, this is not something that I'm only the one. There's just so many people doing it. Right. And the market is so good that it is allowing all of us to do that. Mm -hmm. So now that, that's a very, very interesting point that um, you mentioned that um, it's really a crowded space when it comes to syndication. Yes. Um, and in fact, I had a guest on here not uh, long ago who talked about uh, the the plethora of syndication groups and all these groups. Some are do quite well. You know, apparently mm -hmm. you've done quite well. You mentioned that you just went through a disposition phase yes. where you um, basically uh, sold 260 million, 300 million worth 260 of assets. 260 million worth of assets uh, all in Dallas. Mm -hmm. So these are 60s, 70s, 80s value add properties. And most of them um, of or towards the end of the cycle. Okay. Uh, we acquired them with a three-year horizon in mind. Okay. And since we complete the business plan. And also COVID was pretty rough and we don't want to, you know, overstay our extent. <laughs> yeah, you didn't want to be over overly exactly. exposed during that exactly. part of the cycle. So you guys have done well. Obviously yes. you're you're a good GP. Mm -hmm. Um and no doubt you're earning your promote. I think so. But <laughs> there are other groups that get into the space that just failed miserably. Yeah. Now, why would you? What would you say is the difference, uh, especially for folks who are, are perhaps looking to invest their money with a syndicator? Uh, it, it's important to understand uh, the difference between a good GP. Uh, that's the guy that's running your project that, mm -hmm. that has who's going to execute the plan uh, with regards to this asset, uh, and then a uh, a GP general partner that may not be as good. What would you say the, the primary differences between the two groups are? I would say clarity, right? Clarity, understanding mm -hmm. on exactly what's happening to the to, to the T, right? Like, mm -hmm. like I personally, in oh, I started in 2016, right? The commercial real estate. Until date, I have raised $101 million. I have returned back about $56 million of the original equity and mm -hmm. an equity multiple uh, back, no cash calls, never lost a dollar investor. Not because Venkat is awesome, not Venk because Venkat is Superman and all that, right? Mm. It's just the market, right? Market right. helped all of us. It's hard to lose money in this market. Right. The only company that I heard, big ones, who lost money in this market is Zillow, mm. right? <laughs> <laughs> They're yeah. the only guys um, who are losing money in this market. So, right. What was that one company that tried to go public? Uh, Open with, door. No, uh, with the uh, the office uh, was it we bought we work we work yeah. yes yeah. that's a, that's they a lost colossal money. figure <laughs> <laughs> so so there are companies losing money yes yeah. yes but not a whole lot right? right the market was so kind to us since 2012 right. right I mean we were just up and the cycle is supposed to taper off but then COVID came and all this massive cash infusion extended the cycle we don't know I personally think it's about three to five years more before. I wouldn't say crash, but it's stag stagnation, yeah. right? Well, the demand for housing will continue to grow because we had a seven year period yes. where there's no new development. Yes. Uh, but you know, 30 years ago, people were still having babies and those babies now yes. need a place to live. <laughs> the household creations, right? I mean, it just yeah. blew the yeah. gasket, especially after COVID. I guess people just want to move out and just stay on their own. There's some aspect to that. Maybe sick and tired of staying together with the yeah. family too long. Right. Well, yeah, we see a lot of that. But yeah, to your question, right? Bad operators in the same. That I would say that inexperience, mm -hmm. right? Uh, inexperience and also complicated team setups. Right. I'm seeing some deals where like there are like 10, 12 GPs. Yeah. 
I, you I, can I, never get anything done. Exactly. Yeah. It's, a, it's so hard as it is for two people to agree on something, right. let alone 10 or 12. So there are a few attributes that investors should look for, right? Obviously, you look for the track record, how long you've been in the business. Mm -hmm. And just pay attention to what they're saying and see if there is any clarity mm -hmm. to what they're trying to do here with a particular deal. Right. When I try to raise money from my Texas investors, who, by the way, thinks that their part, there cannot be any other state than Texas to right, invest. Right. They believe that even if God comes down and tell them otherwise, they won't believe it for <laughs> most of the people. That's my biggest challenge right, right. now because I want to go west and I want to buy in Denver and Phoenix and I won't even build there because the returns are off the chart. I'm talking about 2x, 3x returns that we are getting in Texas. Wow, well, now, let, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you, well, two things I want, I want to uh, talk about. One, uh, you mentioned before mm -hmm. that um, you have found in your experience uh, to maximize that return on investment, yes. um, to create the most value, to get yes. the greatest return multiples, Absolutely. Um, that, that your target is now development projects. Yes. Again, the reason for that is, look, look at the inflation, right? Six mm -hmm. percent. If right. you're making anything less than six percent, you're losing money. Right. Right. So and also second attribute is and, my and, that, and that's what the government has finally come to admit the inflation is. Exactly. The actual inflation is higher than it's that. like Go at ahead. least two. Right. <laughs> exactly. Because if you look at the rental component, they sure. put two percent. What 2%? I mean, rents are going by 20, 30%. Yeah, I, Class A in downtown Dallas, I just learned last week, uh, two bedrooms, as much as 5000 a month. That, there you go, right? <laughs> Enough said. But let's stick to the government at right. 6%. Right. So, I mean, if you produce a 10, 12, 13, it's not a whole lot. And, and the reason that's an issue is because my investors are like not uh, Rothschilds or something, right? right. They're working hard. Everyday I mean, they, people. They have right. Everyday people, mm -hmm. right? They have a limited amount of investable dollars, right? right? They don't have unlimited dollars. Mm -hmm. So when they put money somewhere, we need to deliver a higher return without assuming a crazy risk. Mm. If I'm only focused on return, irrespective of risk, I would start a crypto fund. Mm. And I will trade on the dime. Right. I'm not going to do that, right? right. <laughs> because that is going up and down. And we, we don't have right. that kind of tolerance for the risk. Right. So real estate still provides a good risk adjusted uh, returns. Mm -hmm. And this is a hard asset, especially when the construction costs are going through the roof. I, right. Most people understand this thing, right? But if you are in a market, if you're doing the same exact thing, in this market versus that market, you get significantly higher returns. Let's talk about that now, because yeah. we before our show today, you mentioned that uh, you have identified. Yes. Now I don't want you to give away your trade secrets, uh, but but there's certain things you've identified. Yes. Uh, that could significantly boost returns. Absolutely. Uh, on a development project, what what are what are those things? Absolutely. So I'm not going to bore people by saying uh, business friendly job growth. Of course, right? right? But there is more to that. Mm -hmm. There's more to that, which is number one is your expenses, mm -hmm. right? So what are these expenses in an apartment complex? The payroll, the water bill, uh, the repairs and maintenance and stuff like that, which is almost same everywhere. Mm -hmm. But what makes the big difference is property taxes and insurance. Mm -hmm. In Texas, every dollar, I'm talking about, let's say, 19, mid 1980s um, value at deal. Mm -hmm. You bring in a dollar in rent, you spend 60 cents back on the property. Mm. That's called 60% expense ratio. Sure. And it's very high mm. by in the entire country. It's mm. we are one of the top five or 10 markets where this is happening. Here in Texas? Across country, if you look at it, the expense ratios are not this high everywhere in the country. Wow, so and, we are and it's mainly percent. because, why, why is that? Why is it more Pro expensive? Because Texas doesn't have state income tax, uh -huh. the BDAs are pretty hard on the property taxes. Mm and they're, it's only gonna get worse. Mm -hmm. And the reason, is, just look at the data. Right. Dallas CAD data, if you go to their website, mm -hmm. everything's open, they have their budget in 2015, their budget. And I'm saying Dallas CAD, uh, sorry, Dallas ISD, not right. CAD, mm -hmm. uh, which is school district, right? Because that is where all this money, most of this money is going. Mm -hmm. If you look at there, um, their budget was $1.5 billion in 2015, and they were educating 155,000 kids, spending $9,500 per kid. Wow. Fast forward to 2020, their budget went to 2.1 billion, and they were educating less kids, 150,000 kids, and now they're spending 13,500 a kid. Wow. That's a 50% increase in their budget. Wow. 
okay, did my rents increase right. by 50%? 50% right. <laughs> right? Right. Um, okay, wh- what will happen in the next five years? Mm-hmm. And and in addition to that, we have something called Robin Hood Law mm-hmm. because Texas is a vast state and we have so many counties where, where almost nobody lives, right. but they still need services, right? Mm-hmm. Schools and stuff like that. So Texas government actually overcharges us the tax in the rich counties, mm-hmm. the Collins, the, the Terrans and all that. Mm-hmm. And they take this money and go spend it over there. Mm-hmm. So, and with this latest migration trend that we are seeing, more and more people are moving from the rural areas to the urban areas. Mm-hmm. So now they would have less tax dollars over there. So now we assistance has to go up. Wow. So this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. This tax thing, there is no it's out of control. solution to this thing. Yeah. I mean, these are, we will go through high taxes. And um, one thing uh, that, because um, we, we hear people say all the time that there is no state income tax in Texas. <laughs> well, uh, that's not entirely true. I rather pay income tax. I want it. But right. <laughs> well, l- if you have a business. Yes. So, you know, each each of your properties is owned by a business. That is right. And your revenues are greater than a million dollars. Mm-hmm. Is there mm-hmm. another tax that you pay? Franchise tax. Fran- yes. That's the state tax. There yes. is a state tax on business, yes. and it's not based on what you make. What you, what you it, bring. It, it right? is and based on your revenue. Yeah. So you could uh, have $3 million in revenue mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and create tax liability for yourself Absolutely. and not make a profit Absolutely. and still have uh, taxes to pay in the state of Texas. And that is the thing. The <laughs> so there is a state tax Oh in yeah, Texas. <laughs> and, and then there is this insurance, right? I right. mean, Texas is a high loss state. We're in this tornado alley. We get hit by hail like it's nothing. Right. Um, so the, now the deductibles are going up. Mm-hmm. When I started the business in 2015, um, the deductibles were like 25K on a wind and hail. Right. Now, then they went 100K, now 1%, and now 3%. Right. So imagine $30 million property if yeah. you have a three percent deductible, right. that's nine hundred thousand right. dollars out of your pocket before insurance kicks in. Well, there's that's more money than that because you have to hire the attorney to make sure the insurance ever kicks in. There you in. go. Because we know that you Absolutely. know just because you file a claim, uh, that just means that starts the process of them figuring out how Absolutely. not to pay you. Uh, so, so uh, what I would tell investors is Texas economy right. is a rock star. Right. I don't dispute it. I'm happy that it is that way. Mm-hmm. The job growth and everything. Completely agree with it. But that doesn't mean the landlords are doing well in right. Texas, just like the economy is. It's not, because we have two big handicaps with these property taxes and insurance, mm-hmm. significantly higher, mm-hmm. which is, that's why units are cheap. Right. Like you go to Denver, I'm buying a property in Denver right now for 250 a door, 1970s property. Wow. Um, but here, you can buy the same quality of product for maybe 150 or even less. Right. Well, why is that? Because you make more NOI there than here because you have higher exp- expenses mm. here compared to there. Their expense ratios are like 30%. That is crazy. I know. So you get to keep 70% of every exactly, dollar in revenue. Exactly, exactly. And coupled with that, there's another thing, which is our, our rents are low in texas Mm -hmm. i don't know why they are there is no state income tax Mm -hmm. i think uh, we should pay more in rents than Mm -hmm. other states but for some reason they're low and i suspect that's due to that uh, the the inventory that we generate Mm -hmm. right so we are like a dogecoin of uh, a commercial real estate Mm -hmm. (laughs) where there is unlimited supply we build twenty six thousand units every every year Mm -hmm. and we've been doing that for like 10 years so there was never a scarcity uh, so to speak uh, but if you look at other markets, there are so many interests which stop mm-hmm. this development and all that. So there is some scarcity going on over there and better demographics, better jobs mm-hmm. and all that. And again, let me give you an example. This 1970 property mm-hmm. that I'm um, buying in Lakewood, Denver, mm-hmm. uh, the rents will be, once, I'm, uh, once I upgrade it, my rents would be marketed in 1,700 unit, right? I'm building a class A apartment in Kyle, mm-hmm. which is burb of... Uh, Austin on mm-hmm. Highway 35, mm-hmm. Class A, mm-hmm. a, same square footage, 850 square foot. Mm-hmm. My rents are 1450, wow. Class A. Wow, and your expenses are higher. And my expenses are higher. Wow. There you go. So yeah, so that this, deal in Denver is a bunch exactly, better deal. Exactly, but this is very straightforward concept. I mean, I was able to talk to you over this five minutes, right? Mm-hmm. But two challenges I face as a GP is number one, people understand it, but they don't want to believe it. Mm. They're just so biased uh, right. for Texas. But right. I'm like, I love Texas, but I want to invest where I can get maximum return for my investors. Right. Right. 
And and some and the second thing is, it is somewhat of a complicated thing unless you get good time with an investor. It's hard to get this point across right. unless you are in the industry. Right. 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 So if you if you're not in the industry, if you're purely passive investor. Mm -hmm. Expense ratios, property taxes. Right. It, it, it just it hard goes to way over the head. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. those are my two challenges that I have, and right. I try to use these kind of platforms to get my point across. Right. Um, and and again, it's not to attract all the investors to me. Or so I want them to know. Right. Because that is not what newspapers are saying. Right. Everybody. You know, it's so funny when you <laughs> you think about investments, uh, the investments that have traditionally provided safe, consistent returns are the ones that uh, the government regulates the most yes. when it comes to everyday citizens having Absolutely. the ability to make those investments. <laughs> and, and the worst investments that are the most volatile, uh, the ones that generally historically lose people their money yeah. are the ones the government encourage you to invest in. There you go. It, That's it. It's, it's the it's craziest you do. Yeah, yeah, it's the craziest thing. Like uh, Lakewood property, right, that right. I'm buying. Mm -hmm. the waters got together there. They put a moratorium forever. There is no time limit where they will not let you build more than 1% inventory. And that applies to both single family and multifamily. Wow. They don't want. They, they so they're trying to drive the value up in that. They, th that is what we affectionately call them as NIMBY markets, mm. not in my backyard. Right. Right. <laughs> Which as a developer, it, it sucks, right? right? I mean, it's so hard uh, to deal with that. But as a landlord, I like my, you know, yeah. I don't if want you own, more competition. If you already own a property exactly. there, then your rents are going to go up. And one last thing I want to throw in there, again, mm. food for thought is, folks, do not believe if somebody's saying that people don't want to buy a home anymore, they want to only rent. It, it's just not true for the majority part. Who yeah. don't want a house? Right. I mean, their backyard, their privacy, their fence, yeah. right? I crank up that, uh, you know, sound music, system, yeah, whatever. Barbecue without... Uh, have a grill on the back porch Absolutely. without some, you have someone selling, saying you can't. Right? Yeah, 80 to 90 percent of housing stock in every metro is a single family home, mm -hmm. right? So as an apartment landlord, my biggest competition is not you, my another apartment. My competition is single family. Right. I never want to duke it out with a single family. Right. And that is the problem with Houston. Houston has so cheap houses. Right you won't win that battle. Right. What will happen is, in every demographic, there's a 5, 10, 15 percent of cream of the crop mm -hmm. uh, tenants who are good with their money, they save, they pay their bills, they care about their credit. Mm -hmm. They save up enough and go buy the cheap house and leave you. Right. Now what you're left with <laughs> is not so desirable tenants right. who cannot do the same. I right. know you got to deal with it, right? right? So all I say is that do not go into the markets and try to compete with single family homes because that's a battle you will 100% lose. Right. So I don't, I pick my battles, right? right. So that's why you go into the mountains where <laughs> the homes are like ridiculous. Right. Even if you make $100,000 a year, which is a good salary in right. this country, mm -hmm. you won't qualify to buy an average price home. Right. And so yeah. I have so much gap between uh, what it would cost to buy a home versus coming so, so now it makes sense see and, and it's interesting because I'm in the business mm -hmm. and if somebody brought me a deal at uh, apartment deal at 250,000 a door you know I'm probably gonna be like ah, you know and if the cap rates like two or three percent absolutely I, I'm probably gonna be like you know this is just not a deal yeah. for me but when you think about some of those other factors you know where uh, the scarce scarcity um, your competition with single yes. family houses, um, you know, it is a lot less. Yeah. You know, then you start thinking yeah. that, well, maybe this isn't a bad investment. Absolutely. <laughs> so Absolutely. it makes a lot of sense. Now, with regards to your, your financing, um, and we, we always talk about this uh, because of the fact that, you know, we're a correspondent lending group and a lot of developers, a lot of folks who are new to the industry, when they first get into commercial real estate, they want to run to the bank, hmm. um, which, you know, in my opinion, is, is in a lot of cases the worst source of capital, uh, especially if you're acquiring mm -hmm. uh, a property and you're trying to create value. Um, what have you seen in terms of your experience in capitalizing your assets um, and matching that capital uh, with your disposition strategy? You're going to go in for a two or three year hold. You want to be able to dispose of the asset without a lot of capital cost. 
Mm -hmm. uh, at the back end Absolutely. Um, because people usually focus on interest rate. They don't realize there's some back end capital costs that that interest rate might cost you. I know. Uh, so <laughs> so I know. what do you, um, what, what are some of the things that you've done to, to maximize the value uh, mm -hmm. by controlling your capital costs? So here's the thing, right? I mean, um, it depends on the business plan that we have mm -hmm. for any uh, particular project. Um, like, so we alluded so much about value add, mm -hmm. but you got to give away the credit is due, right? I mean, Texas, man, this is the place, it's it's a developer's paradise, right? right. The cities are so easy to work with, mm -hmm. um, the, the leverage comes in, uh, you can, there's so much demand for land here, zone land, right? right. So for land development and ground up development, I love Texas. Right. It's just easy, you can get in, get out, right, get out right. in two to three years, mm -hmm. and you build, they will come. Mm. Nowhere in the country where you can lease up your property as fast as that it's possible in Dallas. Yeah, and uh, we're, we're developing some yeah. townhomes, and uh, we will have every yeah. townhome sold yeah. before we turn dirt there you on go. the property. So, <laughs> God bless Texas. I right. mean, it's so, it, it, like I said, it's a that's the biggest risk as a developer, right? You want you don't want to build something and, and just stuck with it, it and right. nobody moves in, right. and it's a problem, not right? A pro not, it hadn't been a problem lately in Texas. You do make less margin per unit in Texas, mm -hmm like everybody else. I'm doing two construction projects. Again, just to, these, this is the value I want to add to people, mm -hmm. right, by giving real examples. I'm doing a 338 unit property in, in Kyle, uh, which is Burb of Austin, and then uh, about a 100 unit property in downtown Mesa, which is a Burb of Phoenix. Yeah. And the profit margins are insanely different. About mm -hmm. fifty dollars to $60,000 per unit mark up here mm -hmm. in Texas, and about $150,000 mark over there. Wow. Yeah, because taxes and insurance. Right. Higher rent. And, right. and lower expenses, right? Mm -hmm. That that results in higher NOI per unit, right. yield you higher um, return, right? Higher right. markup. So again, so these are the few things that you have to keep in mind, right? Let's talk about value add first, right? So if you, I have blindly went, because everybody, like like everybody, I thought the interest rates are going up to 2006 levels, mm -hmm. and I put 10 year, 12 year debt with prepays on it, when I tried to sell these properties, the buyer couldn't assume it because he has some issues with the uh, Fannie Mae. So he ended up prepayment, and that's why I knew how much he prepaid. And obviously, you know, I won't get the best price possible with when I burden yeah. it with a, a, an assumable loan. Yeah. So let, let, let's let's talk about that because I want my audience to understand this uh, because uh, this is a real life example. It is. And and you chose that ten year loan because twelve. 12-year loan, and, and the, the thing that caused you to choose that loan was what? The Two rate. things. Number one, anticipation of increasing interest rates for okay. that work. Right. Um, one thing's for clear, clear, guys, this country cannot sustain on higher interest rates. Right. Do not expect it to go to five, six percent like we saw mm -hmm. back in 2006, before the Great Recession, right? Mm -hmm. That ain't gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Because every, this, everywhere in the world, not just this country, right? We are run by debt. Right. China is run by debt. Europe right. is run by debt. Right. And everybody needs this interest rate to be as low as possible. They will not let it go to the previous levels. Yeah. Well, now I know, but back then I did right. not, right. right? Two, three, four years back. So I went and got these 12 year loans, Fannie Mae debt. Uh, it has prepayment penalty, which right. is very steep. Right. I'm talking very <laughs> steep. Right. And we don't think like that when you think the interest rate is going to go up. And I thought, that my 4.5% interest rate will be an asset right. to the guy who's assuming my loan right. because then prevailing interest rates are five, five and a half. That's what we thought. Right. But the opposite happened and we're stuck with these loans where right. <laughs> we're very high. And it makes it hard to get out of. And what happens is when you take 12 year loans, it mm. does size very well for interest only period. Mm. So instead of three years, you get five years, mm. you get low rate, all good, right. but then you'll pay the pipe. So, somehow you'll pay, right. and I ended up paying on the back end of the transaction. Yeah. I will probably never take any fixed loans, uh, fixed rate loans ever. Uh, right. I, I think I don't want to talk about that number. It just depresses me right, on how right. much. And then when you go <laughs> in and calculate the true cost of capital, yes, then then it, it goes up. And so you know now a lot of people don't understand that that's what bridge loans are for. That's it. Bridge loans are designed. Uh, to help you go into an asset, mm -hmm. create value, uh, and you can extract that value out very quickly, very inexpensively, you know. Nicely put. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 but when you put permanent debt prematurely on a transitioning asset, 
you're going to run the risk of trapping your equity, mm -hmm. which makes it very difficult to get out, and your capital costs, okay, that's the cost that you pay that interest rate, mm -hmm. plus the cost to get out of the loan. Yes. And when you calculate that and you do the weighted average cost of capital, that rate is usually more expensive mm -hmm. than if you had just gotten a bridge loan. Absolutely. No, <laughs> I think you, you alluded to very accurately, right? I mean, th that is exactly how it is. We don't pay attention to what is the cost to get out. Exactly. People are so They're focused all on focused two things. focused just the rate. Interest rate and what is the, my points or whatever. Right. Well, there is another thing. I mean, it's a rude awakening. How do you me. unwind this transaction? Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So I go with bridge loans now, yeah. right? Um, uh, even they are stacking up very high on leverage also, right? right? Um, and they're not exactly expensive compared to agency, they're, not well, anymore. Well, when you compare, when you calculate the true cost of capital, they've always yeah. been right on par. Exactly. Or right on par. Um, exactly. And so that's why it's important to match your capital strategy mm -hmm. with your, your business plan mm -hmm. of the asset. But if you have a trophy asset, let's mm -hmm. say, uh, we are not going to buy trophy assets with our investors and right. all that. But let's say if you do, right? Mm -hmm. This is something that you just want to own, let's say, Institutional quality, institutional long quality, term, long and there term. are loans for that. Go ahead and put that. A, that's the ones yeah. you want to do. Or you, a hard loan, heck, I mean, yeah. you, for two percent interest rate or two and a half percent, you can put a hard loan on it. But that should be the business plan for that, exactly. right? Because you are locking yourself into some liability for long term here, right? And you better know that you're doing that. Absolutely. And. Yes, that's a valuable lesson I have learned. I will never now, do Now see, had you been it. working with an advisor <laughs> in the beginning, we would have said, hey, this is what you want to consider. I know, so, but, I know. but now you've learned that. So, yes. Um, but man, I tell you what, this has been a great conversation. Uh, today we've talked about a syndication. Uh, we've talked about you know markets, uh, how one market compares to another, uh, some of the, the various classes of assets that you target. And um, you know, we've gone along that risk curve uh, to show that, hey, you know, you can get these good returns, uh, but you better be prepared for that, that exposure to risk. Yes. Uh, but you get a pretty nice risk premium if you're working with the right GP. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> and Absolutely. so now tell me your top five uh, things that uh, the, your investor needs to know uh, before uh, choosing a syndication group to work with. Number one, before even choosing a syndication group, you gotta choose a market where you wanna invest. Okay. If you Makes pick sense. the right market, mm -hmm. you're already half there. Okay. It's as simple as that. I'm mm -hmm. not exaggerating it. You stand where there is tailwind and not the headwind, and you have nowhere to but to go front, right? right. So that actually narrows down so much for you in order to pick up a syndicator, mm -hmm. right? Because let's say if you wanna be in um, Atlanta, right? right? And, and couple of other markets, and don't spread yourself too thin. I mean, that's not diversification. Mm -hmm. you, you need to master a particular one, two, three, or four, but something that you can count on a single hand. You cannot spread yourself on 10 markets, right? Mm -hmm. That's true for even a passive investor, right. right? So that you can invest in right deals, right? So that's what I would say, pay attention to, do not listen to news, hype, and all that. that folks, like, they oversell Austin, right? right. Uh, somebody yesterday was saying that apparently some report came out where the best place to move in the whole world is Austin, apparently, and number two is somewhere in Tokyo. I yeah. mean, and I've been they don't to Austin, even have roads. It doesn't look like the best place to live to me. Uh, they don't have <laughs> roads. We have muggy weather, <laughs> right. and uh, I don't know what they're talking about, right? right? So please, you know, tune out all these things, pay attention to the numbers, mm -hmm. see what we're bringing in income, what is expenses, expense ratios, break even occupancies. Mm. The high expense ratio. What, let's say in, in Texas, we need to have 85% of the people pay the damn rent before we break even. Wow. That is what the that, repercussion. And that's a very important metric. Exactly. Yeah. Pay attention to those. Yeah. Not the, not the news shell, right? Okay. So that is what I would do. That would be my, m the important one, right? Okay. The second one is invest time in understanding underwriting. The devil is in the details, yeah. right? It looks really intimidating when you look at it and all that. I'm telling you folks, I mean, if you have $100,000 to invest in a deal, I'm sure you have a college education and mm. you have the skill set. Believe me, you it's can do not basic right math. It really exactly. is basic math, right? Exactly. Right. Pay attention to that. Right. You know, that is what makes you so, you know, gives you sophistication and all that. Okay. And number three is ask questions. 
I'm telling you there's so many investors who shows up this webinar doesn't quite understand certain topics, which is completely normal, right. but they don't ask questions. Yeah. So when you ask question, what happens is, not only you get your question answered, but you just open up a communication channel perpetually. Not just this deal, you, you started a relationship, right. right? You started a relationship, which God knows where it'll go, right? right? So that is what I would say, because that's one of my pet peeves where, well, if, if you don't understand something, that is my job to explain, explain to you. It, right. Set up a call, send me an email, Let's talk, right. let's, let's get to the bottom of this thing. Number three is, uh, sorry, number four is the tax advantages, right? Mm. You have to understand the tax advantages here because that is the biggest, one of the biggest uh, um, uh, good thing that we have uh, going on for our real estate is the depreciation. Mm -hmm. You have to understand concepts like cost, uh, mm. cost segregation, mm. bonus depreciation, and how to play for it. I gave up my job with Bank of America because of depreciation. Because mm -hmm. I'm thinking, I can actually save more than what I make at the bank. Absolutely. Job. So uh, I want to take advantage of that. So I want to be qualified as a real estate professional, which I cannot be when I'm working a 2,000 hour full-time job with the bank on exactly. IT, right? So I was able to do that because I understood how that worked, mm -hmm. right? So invest in time to understand the tax situation. Okay. And then finally, I would say that pay attention to the syndicator now, right? Yeah. The syndicator. Make what, sure they're qualified. Qualified. Well, how do you know, <laughs> right? See, you right. gotta see that is the skill set that you gotta pick up. Because mm -hmm. let's say whatever you do, there is no way a passive investor would know more than a GP would know at that given point before closing the deal because he found the deal, he did the due diligence, mm -hmm. he arranged the financing and all that. So he knows more than that. And you cannot get to that stage at the time. So mm -hmm. now it comes to the soft skills. So you gotta pay attention. You should try and perfect reading people, mm -hmm. right? Let's pick up on the cues, right? Their confidence, mm -hmm. right? Obviously you look at, I, I'm not gonna keep saying that, look at their track record, talk to them. Mm -hmm. That's of course you will do all that. Mm -hmm. But the second thing is their confidence. Mm -hmm. And are they just giving you the news in the news channel without numbers? Pay attention to that, right? Like. Somebody was saying that there is a rail line apparently will be built from Dallas to Houston and that's why that person wanted to go buy in Houston. Yeah. And just, uh, I, I was floored, my jaw dropped. It's like, no, I mean, these are not the reasons to buy because we we don't buy for 30 year horizon. Right. We buy for two to three <laughs> yeah, years. That, real, that <laughs> right? thing, I think my great grandchildren might get a, get a chance to ride There you go. That, so <laughs> that, is, that is what I would say, right? right? Pay attention to what, how they're pitching the deal to you, right? right? Um, and are they doing hard sales? Are they talking you into it, right? Mm. These are the few things. Investments have to be done free will. And right. let me tell you why. Mm. And trust me, I can talk people into things, but I won't do I, that. I bet you can. <laughs> and, 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 and most people have this skill, right? right Influencing right. the people. Right. I want to be like a news channel. I mm. want to show the facts. Right. If you believe in it, you would invest. Otherwise you'll wait for the next one, right? right? But I'm not gonna influence you in talking you into investing something well, I, that you I can tell you, my experience, when I have to convince someone to invest oh, no. in one of my deals, I, I regret it. Yes. <laughs> so I, I look for investors yeah. uh, who are willing and ready, and there are Free a lot well. of them, you know? Yes. And so, so that's, there's no shortage and of And the investors. reason for that is, if you talk somebody into investing mm -hmm. when the gut is telling them not to. Right. Even they might invest, right. but they worry. The whole, the whole three time years worry. is the worst three years of your life. And they will <laughs> share that worry with you. And <laughs> with others. <laughs> and, and with others, right? right. And it's, uh, so. it, it, even, the, even when the investment's doing very yes. well. Yeah, yes. so. Well, those, those are some great tips. Well, thank you so much for being back on our show. You're always welcome uh, to come back and show, show, uh, share your experiences. Um, the things that you've learned over the, the time as a GP, uh, syndicating deals. And, and I'd love to hear more about some of these deals that you're buying sure. in other states. I want to hear how they turn out. Absolutely. Uh, but again, thank you so much. And if you like this show and you thought we added value to you, then please uh, be sure and, and hit the like button, subscribe to this channel. Um, if you have questions, if we talked about a concept or a term or an expression uh, that you would like more information on, then write it in the comments. And as he said, when you uh, ask that question, you open up a channel of communication that allows you to learn and you can put that knowledge to work to create benefit for yourself. Again, thank you for being a part of the Capital Playbook. And we absolutely look forward to having you on our next episode.